I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories treaties of the people of Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Bigani, and the Ghana First Nations, the Sutina First Nations, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and I'd also like to note that the University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and that the traditional Blackfoot name for this place is Mokinstance, which we now call the City of Calgary. For those who are not aware uh, or not familiar with the Graduate College, this is the Lunch and Learn series. This is a public presentation aimed to bridge the Graduate College with the Greater Calgary community. These sessions are held monthly over Zoom between April and August. And this provides an opportunity for graduate scholars in the college to present their diverse research for the public. Today, we have two presentations focused on the theme of change and transition, which are two constants in our society today. Our first presenter is Samia Mosen, uh, who is a master's student in the Cumming School of Medicine, and she will be presenting uh, on the impact of family presence on critically ill patients. Our second presenter is Helen Pethrick, a master's student in the Workland School of Education and she will be discussing the impact of telling your story during times of transition. At any time you have any questions for either presenter, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A box in the Zoom chat, and we will address all questions uh, following both presentations. So Samia, whenever you're ready, uh, you can begin your presentation. Perfect. Um, do you mind unsharing your screen so I can go ahead? Yes. Hi, everyone. So uh, thank you for the introduction, Berkeley. Today, I would like to tell you about my proposal research and the kind of questions that interest me and why it is important. So the title of my proposed research is Impact of Family Presence on Delirium in Critically Ill Patients. Picture this. Jenny is admitted to the intensive care unit, ICU, due to a heart problem. Two days in, Jenny feels relaxed, looking over a dot of light in the room. The light increases in brightness, and she instantly feels dizzy and nauseous followed by a series of unexplained terror. Jenny screams, I can't go on like this anymore. Eventually, she opens her eyes and sees her sister next to her, holding her hands, begging her to remain calm and strong. And suddenly, Jenny's torture stops. Up to 70% of patients admitted to the ICU experience this confusional state similar to Jenny. This state is called delirium. This type of experience is represented in this slide, which was drawn by a patient in the ICU and shows the feelings of disengagement and fear associated with delirium. This is a fairly common scenario where family members can help patients calm down, but we actually don't know how much or how big of effect family members can impact critically ill patients, especially when it comes to delirium. So giving a bit of an overview of the general term of what delirium is. Delirium is an acutely disturbed state of consciousness and it is associated with disorganization of behavior. Delirium leads to many negative outcomes, such as longer hospital stays, increased risk of long-term cognitive impairment, long-term mental health problems, such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and increased risk of death. I have two main study objectives. The first being to quantify the association between family presence and the prevalence of delirium in critically ill patients. 
and the second being to evaluate the association between family presence and the duration of delirium in critically ill patients. So I guess my goal is to kind of find that effect, to put a number on it. So previous studies on the matters have been limited. They have studied the effect of family visitation hours in the ICU on the incidence of delirium, and they didn't report on the duration of delirium. Most of these studies were small, single center, which caused generalization issues. So by that, I mean that if a study has a small sample number, it's really hard to generalize those findings to a bigger population or to a different population. However, they did find that increased flexible hours of visitation in the ICU decreased the incidence of delirium in critically ill patients. So the paradigm of medicine has shifted towards optimizing patient and family-centered care, where both patients and their families are integral to the shared decision-making process within the healthcare field. Patients and families are active participants within the healthcare system. And this paradigm shifts from paternalism, which kind of is associated with that doctors have all the power, to neutralizing that power to all those involved in the healthcare. Patient family centered care brings many benefits. Patients and families have unique experiences and expertise that can help in the decision making process which can overall enhance patient healing, well-being, and comfort. Another benefit is, of course, we're avoiding that traditional paternalism where power is associated with healthcare providers only, and now we give a voice to patients and families to what is important to them and how we can help in their healing process. This also improves patient safety and enhances decision-making process in both healthcare and research. Between 20 to 25% of patients in hospital settings receive treatment that is unnecessary or potentially harmful. Family member presence in the ICU specifically increases opportunities of these shared decision-making, which has shown to decrease unnecessary administration of treatment. Families and patients are partners with researchers and healthcare providers. Given my interest in patient family-centered care, my research focused on including patients and families as partners alongside with other researchers and healthcare providers. Their input and involvement are, is invaluable to the success of generating research that is relevant to practice. They have helped me identify what is important to them and they have helped me identify my research question. So how can family presence help in the healing process in delirium in the ICU? Well, family members of critically ill patients may inspire hope for recovery, just kind of like that scenario I described in the beginning of the presentation with Jenny. They can provide psychological support, they can facilitate the treatment of critically ill patients, and they can provide drug-free strategies. Now, this last point is quite important because delirium doesn't have, we don't really have a cure for it. Medications has shown to actually increase delirium and not help at all. So drug-free strategies that family members can employ, such as maintenance of day-night routine, sleep hygiene, and hydration of the patient has shown to decrease the problems associated with delirium and delirium altogether. So given this, we hypothesize that family presence will, within the ICU setting, decrease the prevalence of delirium and decrease the duration of delirium in patients who already have delirium. This will be possible by using a large body of health records. Now, Alberta is especially situated for this kind of research because we have an intensive medical record history and bedside recording system within the ICU. We will be able to employ a retrospective study design with over 15,000 patients. Now with retrospective, I mean that we're going to look at patient records and then look back retrospectively at their ICU stay and determine if a family member was or was not present. 
This data was collected from all 17 adult ICUs in Alberta, Canada, between the dates of January 1st, 2014 to December 30th, 2018. So I will be using two tools within my proposed research. The first being the ICDSC, which is also known as the Intensive Care Delirium Screening Checklist. This is an eight item delirium measurement tool and we appoint one point for each category. So for example, hallucination, um, cognitive impairment, confusion. And this is a standardized checklist used in the ICU Within Alberta, it is required that a critically care nurse would check using the ICDSC if a patient has delirium twice a day for every hospital stay or ICU stay of that patient. So we routinely you know, use it to check for delirium. And through this, we will be able to measure if delirium was present or absent. Now, another tool that I will also illustrate an example of how I use it is an algorithm. This algorithm was developed by my team and is specialized for the medical records that I will be using. So like I said, previous studies have been looking at increased family visitation hours. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that a family present like, or a family member was present for that patient more or less. So instead, we decided to see if a family member was or was not present. This isn't always documented. There is a checklist within medical records where like nurses or doctors can kind of say, yes, the family present, like family was present or not present for that patient. However, most records on family presence is written in free text. And so to manually read free text for each of the 15,000 patients in my study wouldn't be feasible. So instead I'm using an algorithm which is a natural languaging processing tool. It is rule-based and it is able to analyze information from free text and determine if family was present for a patient. Now I will walk you through an example of this. Let's say that the category is family in. The algorithm will be able to read that like free text under that category that was written by social care workers, doctors, nurses, healthcare providers, and if, for example, it says significant other in, which means that a significant other was present for that patient or visited that patient, we will be able to say and identify that family member was present. Now the algorithm also has exclusion criteria. So for instance, say that the free text said research coordinator in, the algorithm is able to differentiate that that isn't really a family member of the patient and we'll be able to exclude that and identify that patient as not having a family member to be present. We will be using statistical modeling to understand the influence of family members on was there or was there not delirium? And second, if there was delirium, how long did it last? And we will compare these results to patients without family members in order to quantify that estimate of effect. The analysis plan has many strengths. First, we're using a large sample size. Again, so over 15,000 patient records will be or have already been collected. It is, mon it is a multi-center analysis. We're using all 17 adult ICUs in Alberta. And we are able to give a more comprehensive view of family presence using a validated algorithm. Again, just to reiterate, the algorithm is now able to give me extra information by reading that free text if a family member was or was not present. But of course, as everything, my analysis plan does have a few weaknesses, which are common to many studies. So the checklist isn't always perfect, meaning that there are some false positives. The false positive rate is quite low, but it is still present. For instance, those without delirium can sometimes be identified as, as those with delirium, known as a false positive. And then another limitation is that family communication is not always recorded. So although I, yes, I am using an algorithm and it will give me a more comprehensive view on family presence for each patient, if family communication is not recorded, 
then I wouldn't be able to identify if or if there wasn't a family member present for that patient. So the goal of my study is to improve the health outcomes of many sick patients, just like Jenny. Given the high prevalence of delirium in critically ill patients, it is imperative to know the potential roles family members play on delirium outcomes. This proposal will quantify the effect of family presence on the prevalence and duration of delirium in the ICU, which can directly inform current stakeholders, such as patients, families, healthcare providers, and Alberta Health Services on policy changes to increase family involvement in the ICU. Now a few take home messages. I hope by the end of this talk, you now get a better understanding of what patient family centered care is. And that of course you understand the importance of family and their role in the healthcare field. And the importance of being there for someone who is sick. So I know that um, it's, it's always a good idea to visit people that are sick and um, within social distancing now and just being there for them. And I really want to reiterate the importance of that and that, you know, there is an effect and there are studies that have shown this and that hopefully with my proposal, I will be able to quantify um, an even so, like a solid number for family presence in the ICU. And then, of course, I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Kristen Feist. Um, she is not only my supervisor, she is also my mentor, and she has helped me develop this research proposal. I would like to thank my committee members, Dr. Kara Suaro, Dr. Daniel Niven, and my team who helped develop the algorithm, Dr. Carla Kruak, Dr. Felipe Lucini. And I don't know if you guys watch The Office, but um, my lab group, we call ourselves the Annex Girls because we don't have windows in our labs, and I would like to give them a huge acknowledgement. Brianna Rosjan, Stefana Sharak, and Victoria Owen. Thank you guys for listening to my talk. Thank you so much, Mia, for that presentation. Um, our next presenter now is Helen Pethrick. Um, Helen, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen now and begin your presentation. Thanks so much, Berkeley. All right, I am really excited to share all of you today um, my presentation about telling your story during times of transition. If you missed the introduction, my name is Helen Petrick. I'm a master's student at the Workland School of Education. And there's two main things I'm going to be talking about today. The first is um, telling stories. And I wanted to thank Samiha for starting her presentation today with the story about Jenny and her experience with delirium. I think it speaks to the power of storytelling that I'll be expanding on today. And the second is transition. Maybe you have um, seen this quote before or heard of it, that the only constant is change, which is apparently said by a, some Greek philosopher. Um, and maybe this phrase has become a little bit of a cliche, but I think it really speaks to um, the fact that we're all experiencing transition and that this is something that's really important. I think I wouldn't be an education student if I didn't start off with some learning objectives. So what can you expect to learn today? By the end of today's talk, you will be able to um, explain why transitions matter in post-secondary learning environments. You'll be able to articulate how a story can help navigate transitions. And you'll also be able to start thinking about how to tell your own story. I wanted to start off with considering some scenarios. Maybe you could call them stories. First of all, um, I wanted to um, uh, acknowledge that the inspiration for these scenarios does come from an online tool called um, Tools for Holistic Mental Health Strategies, and the link to that will be in my references slide. So first of all, we have Cindy. She is a first year undergraduate student. She was born and raised in a small town just outside of the city where she is now a first year university student living in residence. She plays on the varsity basketball team, which is a lot more intensive than her high school team. She was the top of the class and the best basketball player back at home. And now she realizes that the academic and athletic expectations are much higher than in high school. She's also never lived away from her family. Although she's developed some close friendships on campus, 
most other students have come from big cities and don't seem to be struggling with the same things that she is. She avoids talking about her small town background for fear that um, she won't fit in with her new friends. And then we have Peter, who is a third year PhD student studying computer science. He moved to Canada for his graduate studies and his wife still lives in his home country of Sweden. He lives alone in a small apartment near campus. He thought that everything was going fine in his program until his supervisor unexpectedly announced that she was leaving the university for a, an industry job. Peter felt blindsided by his supervisor's decision, and now he has to navigate a confusing bureaucratic process to find a new supervisor with only months to go before candidacy. He feels ashamed that his degree progress is being delayed, and he doesn't know how he would explain the setback to future employers or to his family back home. And now I invite you to think about a transition that you might have experienced. Maybe it was an academic transition, like Cindy or Peter, like starting a new program or switching supervisors. Maybe it was the transition to online learning or working from home that many of us have been experiencing. Whatever it was, maybe you've also experienced some confusion, just like Cindy and Peter, as you navigate that transition. Something you might have noticed as a commonality is that um, Cindy and Peter both had difficulty thinking of ways that they're going to express that they were experiencing a transition to the people around them. And what I want to um, introduce today as a solution to that, one solution is storytelling. First, I did want to just explain a little bit about what I mean when I say transition. Um, I really like this definition. Uh, transition is a period of passage between the old and the new, between associations of the past and hoped for associations with communities of the present. Uh, Vincent Tinto, who I've cited here, was actually one of the first scholars to think about transitions in post-secondary education. He approached the issue from the perspective of student retention and attrition. He wanted to know why students dropped out of college and university. He found that the first six months of the student experience were especially important for predicting whether students would persist in their post-secondary education. Drawing upon theories from anthropology, sociology, and psychology, Tinto developed a theory for post-secondary student transitions that has spurred conversations since in academic and practitioner communities about student transitions. Numerous studies since then have explored all aspects of student transitions, expanding the idea to all aspects of the student journey. Transitions can occur at any stage of the student journey, um, but the most common, um, perhaps the most universal, although everyone experiences them differently, is the transition to university as a first year student um, and the transition out of university when you graduate. And then there's all these transitions that can happen in the middle, such as um, changing majors or switching your supervisor, maybe transferring to a new school that um, can uh, be really far reaching and unique. Since Tinto's research on retention and attrition, literature has turned attention to some of these positive concepts of flourishing and thriving rather than merely persisting in post-secondary education. My research focuses on transition and mental distress. In my research, um, I'm doing a qualitative study where I interview um, first year university students about their experiences of, from, of transition from high school to university um, and then um, uh, the students who have self-identified as experiencing mental distress. And this is a way of getting at some of the intersections between um, this concept of um, mental well-being and uh, transitions and kind of how these things um, interact with one another. The reason why I wanted to just give this quick um, explanation of my research is because um, the work that I've been doing on this research um, is where my messages today have um, been drawn from. Since there's all this research about transitions, there's also lots of conversations about how to support healthy transitions, because we know that when a transition happens, it can happen well, and um, we can come through the other end with um, lots of positive things. So what kind of, what kind of supports are out there? So first, institutional supports can be very helpful. You might think how Cindy could have maybe seen an academic advisor um, to, uh, to help with some of the challenges she was having, or Peter could have accessed his graduate program director, or maybe an ombuds person or something like that, even a career services. Programs for new student orientation, student life programming, mental health services, these are all really important for supporting transitions. 
And second, psychosocial support from peers, family members, and friends can supplement the more kind of instrumental support that you might get from the institution. Having a caring support system, both on and off campus, helps us cope with things that are challenging. What I want to focus on today, telling a personal story, can seem individualistic in comparison to these other supports. So let me be clear, changing your personal narrative is not the catch-all solution to surviving and thriving through challenging circumstances and transitions. It can be incredibly empowering to have a story that is your own and to be able to articulate that story to the people around you. Storytelling as a strategy to navigate transitions, though, will only be effective in tandem with institutional and, and psychosocial supports, and as well systemic change to make those supports more inclusive and accessible to all. And I hope what you can realize by, um, by the end of my talk is that um, all of these things are actually inter interconnected. So let's move on to the second concept I talked about. We talked about transition, now let's talk about stories. I want you to think about what you might imagine when you think of a story. Do you think of a fiction book? It's just a story. Do you think of something that has a clearly demarcated beginning, middle, and end? Do you think of a story, especially when we think about sharing stories about challenging circumstances, an inspirational piece you might read in a newsletter or, um, or a memoir or something like that? All of these things could be true. I also want you to to, um, to, I, want, I want to encourage you to expand your idea of what a story might be. So it could be something that is about someone's own personal lived experience. It could be a, a, a true story. It could be something that um, is more broad than this idea of a beginning, middle, and end. And it doesn't have to be so carefully edited and inspirational as you might find in, um, say, a You Today story. The reason why I think of stories as so, um, so broad about this is because of the methodology that I use in my research, which is narrative inquiry. Narrative inquiry is all about getting stories from participants and learning things from those stories. And the, the people who have come up with this methodology have really established that a story is all about experience and lived experience. The other thing I want you to think about stories is um, a quote here um, from a book that um, really um, uses narrative inquiry to investigate transitions. So I'll read this. Sometimes there is awareness of being in a state of transition. At other times, people are unaware of having undergone a time of change until they look back and see that their lives are inexorably changed. They may wonder, how did I get here? Such a question invokes a need to restory their life, to make sense of events so that they form some coherent narrative. Let's focus on this kind of last sentence here. I think this is where the power of um, constructing a personal narrative really comes from, is that you might be undergoing confusing circumstances, transitions that don't make sense, but there is an opportunity here to restory those experiences and come up with this coherent narrative that can be shared with others. This takes us to Storytelling 101. Um, maybe this title is a bit less misleading. Spoiler alert, there is no authoritative guide to how to tell um, your personal narrative. But maybe some of these questions can prompt you a way to, um, to think of ways to construct this. First of all, I want you to think about who your audience might be. Who do you want to tell this story to? This could be an employer or a family member, your friends, and so on. It could be a specific person. There's someone who you know you want to sit down with and explain things to, or it could be to um, a general group. You know that you're applying for jobs and you know you're gonna need to come up with a compelling story for your cover letter. Then you might want to think about what's your transition? Are there multiple things going on? Is it a career transition or life transition? And think about that quote that I shared with you on the last slide. Um, if we can develop self-awareness, we can take that, that step back and say, um, what am I experiencing right now? Then we have this opportunity to, to restory it. And then the other thing um, with taking a step back is to notice whether there are common threads that you could weave into a narrative. For example, with that job application um, uh, example, perhaps you take a look at your resume or your CV and you notice that there's a few words or a common phrase that could really um, point out what unifies all of those experiences. And the next step, and uh, let, me, uh, let me say that this is all very iterative, is to try it out. You might go to someone who you, who you trust, a close friend, significant other, um, a, a counselor or someone like that that you trust, and try telling this story. 
Um, see if it feels authentic when you say those words out loud. And I think that when we talk to someone else, you can actually start to figure out some of those earlier questions. You might, um, uh, something might crystallize about what that transition is, or you might want to think of other ways to tell it that, that feel right to you. Let me give some examples now, moving back to um, those stories that I told you at the beginning. So if you remember, Peter was undergoing these transitions of being an international student and as well having to find a new supervisor mid-program. So maybe Peter decides that his audience for one of his stories is employers. He's applying for an internship or something like that. And you know, he takes a step back, does some reflecting, looks at it, and says, actually, the common thread here is resiliency in the face of adversity. I've done some really challenging things, and I've come through it on the other end. Maybe the way that he tries this out is by writing a cover letter, um, making that his personal statement, or um, going to a career fair or a career advisor and um, trying to work out some of these things about, um, about how this story makes sense. And then we have Cindy. If you remember, she was having difficulty um, telling her friends about um, her transition moving from a small town to a big city. She thought that no one else had this experience. So um, maybe the story that she decides to tell is to her peers and she um, decides to take this thing that she's struggling with and turn it into a, 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 this common thread about searching for, for new experiences um, and new challenges. So this could be as simple as now when she meets someone new, she has the confidence to say um, that she's from a small town and she came to the big city for university because she's always searching for new and exciting horizons. And now I also want you to think about a transition, again, that you might be going through. Think about some ways that you could be presenting this to an audience. What is your transition? What's that common thread? And who do you want to share it to? The last thing I'd like to emphasize is that it's all interconnected here. So think about those institutional supports and psychosocial supports um, I spoke about earlier. Telling your story can make you feel more confident in accessing other supports. Maybe um, because you realize you have something to say to employers, then um, you go and access some supports at, uh, at say, career services. As well, accessing supports, for example, talking to a friend or seeing a counselor can help you tell your story better because I think that stories are really developed when, uh, when we do tell them to other people. As well, if you don't feel ready to share a story, it's something that's too vulnerable or something that you um, just don't feel ready to share with other people yet, that's okay. I think that it's incredibly validating to have a story that's your own and to acknowledge that validation doesn't necessarily have to come from um, shouting your story from the rooftops. Um, it, it can be your own and you can find confidence in just um, having, having a mindset shift around that. So to conclude, I think that my one big takeaway is, um, if you can take anything from this, uh, from this presentation, is to know that transitions are normal, everyone experiences transitions, and that there are ways to work through them, as you can kind of see um, in this visual here. If you'd like to read more about transitions, I do have um, some references here that I've cited, and I'd encourage you to, um, to read more and to ask me questions as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for, uh, for listening today. Um, I uh, appreciate the chance to share with you all, and I look forward to um, continuing the conversation in our question period. Awesome. Thank you so much, Helen, for a great presentation. Uh, we will move over now to the Q&A session. So we'll open up the floor to any questions. Uh, we have one question so far posted by Carolyn. Um, I will read it out. So the presentation on storytelling makes me think of journaling. What connection do you make between those two concepts? Sure. Thanks so much for your question, Carolyn. Um, I think that there, um, there's so much uh, to be said about the relationship between storytelling and journaling. Um, so I think that um, maybe what we're touching on a little bit here is the creativity that can come out of um, telling your personal story and your narrative. Um, so journaling is maybe one way that you can try it out. Um, if you don't feel quite ready to tell that story yet with, um, with other people, um, sometimes it can be really reassuring to, um, to write something down and to see it on a page. And that can be a way to test out whether you feel that that story is something that's, that's authentic. And it's also a way to try out new possibilities and be creative. So thanks for bringing up the really important connection between those two concepts.
Awesome. Thank you, Helen. Uh, we have one, another question for Helen from Julia. What benefit does storytelling have for job searching and career transitions, especially during COVID-19? Thanks so much, Julia, for, um, for asking that. Um, I think career transitions are a big transition that students experience, that, um, that uh, all people are experiencing right now. I think one of the big transitions that people are experiencing right now is job loss. And then another one is um, the kind of post-graduation um, job search that might have been really disrupted by um, a lot of um, ways that companies are um, decreasing their hiring right now. So I think that um, there's some definitely like structural and systemic things here that, that really need to be addressed. When I think about how storytelling can help us, however, um, I think about how um, making this coherent narrative out of a confusing circumstance can be really powerful for um, writing that cover letter, sitting down in a job interview and making yourself stand out. And I think this is where the, the try it out advice becomes really important, is that um, once you say that I, I have um, something that really unites me as a person, then you can practice it with other people. You can use it for networking and um, you can um, use it to navigate the um, confusing career transitions that are happening right now. Awesome, thank you, Helen. Uh, we have one more question here. Um, actually, it's, it's towards Samia. So uh, it's from Kelsey. I was wondering what other connections to storytelling may relate to your research on family presence and patients in the ICU and how discussion may have influenced healing in your research. Thank you so much for your question, Kelsey. That's a really good one. Um, I think that because patients and families have unique experience and expertise, it is through their stories that I'm able to identify my research question and um, being able to implement integrated knowledge translation and find research that is relevant to practice and relevant to their needs. Um, it is through me engaging with them and continuously listening to their stories, their feedback and their engagement in my research that I'm able to promote patient family-centered care. And I think that, you know, in any research that involves people that, you know, by engaging with their stories and listening to their storytelling, um, you're able to have them as partners rather than just participants. Awesome, thank you so much, Samia. I also have a question regarding your presentation. Um, regarding the impact of family present, you talk about a lot of positive benefits. And I was wondering if there's a certain threshold in terms of the frequency of visitation that can lead to positive effects because families have varying levels of commitment and availability to come into the ICU. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on this. So there's been limited studies and um, kind of like I said, there hasn't really been a quantification on like um, how much is good, how much is bad. In general, being a caregiver or a family member seeing a patient with delirium is quite distressing. And by having family members just be active in being there for them and through even letting them know through this research that, you know, you're actually helping in the healing process, I think they feel less hopeless like I think a lot of times through talking with families they're like well I just want them to get better and I, I can't do anything and you know as little as like in Jenny's story holding their hands and that just impacted um, Jenny when I talked to her she was like well all it took was my sister holding my hand and I was fine and so there's always different stories uh, regarding this uh, unfortunately there there aren't any policy changes or like I don't know there isn't really the in the ICU, it's such a rigorous like, kind of environment that it's not like families are really promoted to stay there. So there just isn't research on, you know, how, how much is too much or how little is too little. But in general, I think we're moving towards having families actively be part of the healing process and actively using tools to reduce delirium in patients. I think I also want to, um, like, I'm, I'm just uh, seeing some connections here as you're speaking, Samiha, and I'm also um, reading um, in, the, in the chat, uh, Kelsey, you mentioned um, about story and climate change and um, living in uh, lives and lands in transition. And I think what this 
um, is kind of bringing out to me is that there's ways to take things that we might think of medical, like delirium or scientific, like climate change, and and to restory those. And I think that can be really powerful for um, for for better outcomes to make kind of like meaningful change, whether that's in like um, uh, patient family centered care or climate action um, when when we're telling stories about these about these things. Um, so I just wanted to um, acknowledge both of those comments there. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Carolyn for Samia. Do you think there might be a greater use of video conferencing with re relatives of patients in the ICU during times of pandemics and related issues? That's a really important question, Carol. Um, so actually, uh, my lab and of course my supervisor, Dr. Kirsten Feist, she's right now um, kind of seeing research on how the the pandemic has impacted patients in the ICU and right now patient like families can't really visit patients just because um, they'll put them at higher risk and that has caused a huge problem like emotionally mentally and of course with delirium and I do think that video conferencing would help I think any little thing helps for instance I know that through talking through and this is another population but senior homes um, they said that they were feeling quite lonely and that all they want was a card from a random stranger. And so uh, the graduate college actually uh, started like we started like a service committee. And now we're using that to engage with seniors by writing them letters and just, you know, letting them know that we're there for them. So I think any little gesture will make a huge difference. And of course, I think through using video conferencing within the patient setting would also make a difference. Thank you for your question. I have another question for Samia. So this is from Vincent. Uh, great presentation. It reminds me of student engagement in medicine. How do you check balance, check and balance the storytelling and professional care um, so that emotions are checked and the patient's well-being is the priority? That's a really good question, Vincent. Um, I think they go hand in hand. So I really think that the paradigm of medicine is going towards compassion and empathy. And so healthcare providers are actually suffering with their parent, with their patients. They're holding their hands through their journey and they're kind of figuring out what is best for them through their stories. And then I think that the balance comes with, you know, that you're able to be compassionate and empathetic. But at the same time, you have the professionalism and knowledge to make decisions that is in the best interest of your patient and what your patient wants and that they are a partner with you um, in the shared decision making process. Thank you. Great. I have a question for Helen. How does your talk today relate specifically to the, pre the research you're doing? I think what I wanted to um, do with today's presentation is to focus on some um, kind of like practical things that we could come out of this with. Um, so I get to start data collection for um, for my uh, research that's starting in in the fall, and I think I've been doing a lot of like thinking with um, my literature review right now that um, and and connecting that back to my own experiences and the things that I see um, that are going around on campus right now. So I think that um, the experiences that I bring in has helped me um, kind of create a story for my research. And I think that um, what I really wanted people to get out of today was to, um, to learn how storytelling can help all of us. And I think that um, uh, Samia has touched on this in our conversations today have, have also kind of addressed this in our question period. Great, thank you so much, Helen. Uh, we'll just leave the Q&A open for a couple more minutes here to allow more questions. I have a question for Samia uh, regarding uh, the specific mechanisms within um, 
family presence and if there's any specific tools that families can take moving forward in order to kind of help their ill family members, whether it's in a uh, critical care center or even a senior home that we touched on in this discussion. Oh, that's a great question, Berkeley. Thank you for asking. Uh, I definitely think that there's a lot of research going on in different settings where we're actively trying to engage families to participate in research and tools within delirium. Um, and I, I think I, I think I would love if I could advise family members to be active in that. I know it's sometimes difficult to want to be part of um, research, but sometimes there's research where We've given family members tools to help with delirium. So delirium is associated with, for example, confusion and sometimes cognitive impairment. So we've given um, like puzzles to family members and they just, they go in and they try to do a puzzle with their patient and through that they're kind of like actively um, having patients use their mind and get out of that mental state that they're, you know, they're unable to move and some patients are mechanically ventilated for such a long time that that definitely pays a toll on their mental health. So I think that just being there, being active, um, participating in research involving uh, patients and how they can help will really make a difference. And even, um, it doesn't even have to be a hospital setting. I think just showing compassion and being there for someone while they're sick and asking them how you can help will make a huge difference. Thank you. Great. I have a question from uh, Sinzhou. Um, do you, uh, for Samia, do you, do you know about the impact of friends on patients with delirium? Do they provide the same comfort as family members? That's a great question. Um, we've been focusing on family members and we've been including significant others as family members. And I think, um, we have we haven't we we're not going to differentiate I guess between friends and families because usually the, these things are documented in free text and uh, it's not always clear who's visiting. But I think if after we find that family members do have an effect, then we'll probably have more policy changes, maybe better recording system of who's visiting, and then we can find out if you know friends and families differ in a way. But uh, I really personally I would say that. Um, a caring friend could act like a sister or a brother or a family member um, and you know can fall under that same category and still provide benefits to the patient. That's a great question though, thank you. I have a question from Kelsey for, uh, addressed to both of you. So um, wonderful discussion, thank you. Do either of you have any readings to recommend that you'd like to share that we can follow up if we're interested? Yeah, thanks for um, asking that, Kelsey. Um, as I was reading your question, I was thinking of something that could be easily um, accessed by everyone. Um, so something that, um, uh, I've been working on for the last few months um, with a job that I have um, that's all about the, the student journey. And I think that um, there is a resource I could share here that would help everyone understand some of the transitions that students might go through. Maybe this is um, kind of uh, things that might be um, uh, obvious already because uh, many of us have been students before, um, but I think to, to step back and take a look at what is the student journey? Um, what are some of the things that our students experiencing? And especially this resource has um, a, a, a focus on, um, on how transitions and things that students experience can impact their mental health. Um, so it's called the student journey map um, and I just posted the link in the chat if anyone would like to go look at that so that you can start thinking about, um, about transitions in um, the kind of post-secondary student journey. That's a great suggestion, Helen. Um, I think that uh, one resource I really liked was kind of from a book, it's called Best Care at Lower Cost, The Path to Continuously Learning Healthcare in America. Although it is specifically to America, it talks about there is a chapter on like engaging patient families and communities and I will drop that in the chat. So you guys can go check that out. I think it was really helpful. I think just continuously, um, I think definitely the path of empathy and compassion requires you to be uh, cognitive about it continuously and it's a working in progress. And um, I don't know, unlike the popular opinion, I think you can learn 
how to be more empathetic and how to better be there for people around you, those who are sick, even just being support. Um, thank you. Thank you, both of you. I have a question from Vincent to Helen. So storytelling is very cathartic, uh, but too much transparency in the working world has its setbacks. What are your thoughts on this, especially during interviews? That's a great question, uh, Vincent. And I think it's, again, touching on this question about career transitions and um, kind of creating your own stories so that um, you can uh, do well in that job search, um, or maybe just to, be, to, to, to be start thinking about it. So um, I, I kind of see what you're getting at here, Vincent. You're um, saying that sometimes when uh, we're too vulnerable, then that can um, open us up to uh, possible disadvantages. So you're right, I have um, been showing um, and representing storytelling as something that can be really positive. I think that, um, that you're right, I think that there's always a time and place for when we should be sharing stories, which stories and how. There's always ways to um, explain experiences, especially if they're negative ones in a positive light, to think about what we learned from them and how they're going to bring us forward. So for example, if you had a really bad experience, you know, Peter, he um, changed his supervisor. If Peter came into his job interview and said, uh, my supervisor was terrible, this was awful, <laughs> and they suck, then I think that that would be a way to present a story in not so positive of a light. But if there's, uh, if Peter came into the job interview and said, um, and stuck to his story of, um, I think it was resiliency through um, adversity, and he said that um, I experienced a setback that I didn't expect, I had to switch supervisors, and this really showed how I was able to um, work through this challenge and come out of it a stronger person. And this will help me in my job with XYZ. I think that there are, that, 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 to, that example to me shows that there are, um, there, there's positive ways to, um, to frame experiences that um, are, are appropriate to share, especially in a work environment. Great, thank you so much. Um, if we don't have any more questions, we will transition over to the closing remarks. Um, and I'd also like to uh, reiterate, um, although there's been a lot of questions, there's also been a lot of positive um, feedback regarding both your presentations. They're really great, very thoughtful, and gave us a lot to reflect on. So now that we're nearing the end of our Lunch and Learn series, I'd like to give a huge thank you to both of our presenters, Simi and Helen, for great presentations. Um, and I'd also like to mention that the next Lunch and Learn session will be held on July 29th from 12 to 1 p.m. So please stay tuned for more details regarding uh, registration. And these, these details will be on the Graduate College Eventbrite website, as well as released in the Grad Post and UCalgary Today uh, emails. I'd also like to give a huge thank you for our audience and attendees today for attending and this session and creating a great discussion. If you'd like to connect with the Graduate College at any time, uh, please connect with us, whether that's through our email or social media. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Lunch and Learn session. Thank you so much. I'll leave the slide up for a couple minutes if you would, any of you would like to take down the information for the Grad College.